Welcome to uh, this week's uh, lunchtime seminar presented by the Center for Trend Research. Um, we welcome to, today. We're welcoming Professor Associate Professor Fabio Daniano uh, from our um, from the center itself. Um, Fabio is going to uh, talk about his one of his projects that he's um, working on uh, within the center here, and we'll also give you a little bit of a background on how he's working, how he got to where he wants to be. And uh, yeah, so take, I shall uh, hand over to Fabio. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I will be, uh, the, this talk is recorded. You will be able to see recording of this uh, from tomorrow onwards on the CFPR website. Thank you for coming. Over to you, Fabio. Hello, thank you for coming. Good afternoon. I uh, wonder if there are um, people with visual impairment uh, among the audience. In that case, please tell me. I will try to describe the images uh, while I'm sharing my screen. Uh, if not, I will just um, leave it as is. So I think we can just start. Uh, everything should work properly. Uh, so today I will, I will uh, talk about my uh, experience and my background before uh, starting my activity here at CFPR. And uh, if there's enough time, maybe I can also show you uh, the latest project we are um, uh, carrying on uh, at the Center for Fine for Prince Research. And but um, I just wanted to take uh, the advantage of this um, talk to uh, try to. Uh, look at all this long journey, which has been almost a 10, uh, a 10 years journey. And I, I would like to, to roll back uh, to, to see with you everything from the first prototype until the last, which is never the last uh, prototype, to, to talk to you about the failures and the good uh, moments and uh, the sense of it, because since the very beginning, there were some core questions like, is it fair that uh, visually impaired um, people are in some way excluded by uh, common experience such as visiting a museum or could um, a blind person being uh, interested in exploring something that it can't really fully uh, experience or which has been made for someone else? How can we translate uh, things that are made for other senses like colors or other nuances or even shapes uh, to a blind person? So um, th these are really questions that are in some way paralyzing, paralyzing you uh, because there's it's not an easy answer, except that, yes, we have to uh, make the world of art more accessible uh, to all. Uh, but let's uh, start from the very beginning. Uh, it was um, 2012, and I was uh, supervising an interesting um, thesis, a master course thesis, and the idea was how can we use 3D printing? 3D printing was really uh, uh, a recent uh, technology in 2012, and also electronic prototyping to transfer architecture to a, a blind uh, person. And um, Serena, which was one of my students, combined the two things together, electronic prototype prototyping and 3D printing. And the idea was to have a, a talking model, something that you could just touch and have an audio feedback when you were touching the object. So my first, I, I didn't know anything about that topic, really anything. And so the first thing I've told her was go out and check everything that has been made on this specific topic, do a nice, good and strong literature review and then come back to me and we will uh, think about uh, something. And then after a few weeks, she came back to me and she told me, actually, there's 
not much out. There's almost nothing out there because no one is combining touch and hearing new technology, 3D printing. There's, there's almost nothing. So uh, my answer was, well, let, let's do it. Let, let's just start a new company and let's do it. So my student and I, we launched a, a startup, a, a new company, and the aim was exactly to build some prototypes for um, for uh, the blind, basically use new technologies for the blind. And we presented the idea at the Maker Fair in 2013 in Rome, and this had a good success, a good traction, uh, feedback on, on the net, on the web, and we even that year we won some prizes here and there, even some money, and we were spending time developing something uh, that for us was a good idea, great idea, but we haven't at that moment contacted any uh, anyone from the blind community. So if we thought it was meaningful, but we haven't asked to anyone. So uh, here you can see a a frame for um, from a short uh, film uh, they made in 2014, and uh, we had a group for the first time of 10 visually impaired of any kind, uh, young, old. Uh, some of them, for instance, were um, blind from from the birth. Um, uh, others they became. Uh, blind. Some of them were expert in art or design before. Some uh, others they just didn't have any experience. Um, but for the first time, we really actually had good feedbacks and bad feedbacks, of of course. And uh, for the first time, starting from from the the very first prototype where you were touching an object and the object was talking, we decided to transfer the te technology on the person so to make it a wearable thing. And well, you, you see that it was kind of bulky. Uh, we were interested in, in how it could work, not that much in how it looked. And, uh, but again, for the first time we had someone who used our technology and who had something to say. Uh, for instance, uh, Lucilla, uh, she, she was like, you know, my ears are sweating with, with this thing. And she, she used to uh, move uh, quite a lot. Her head is common and she was nodding often. And because she had this enormous uh, and heavy piece of technology over her head, uh, it was um, was falling, and uh, it, it was heavy. It was not 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 natural, and um, it had even other problems, like it was starting by its own and and everything. So that there was a negative but really useful feedback. But the positive feedbacks were were really really useful and positive for us because. Yes, we are absolutely happy that someone is taking care um, of this problem, is working with us, is working for us. So they appreciated uh, this um, project incredibly with a great support. So we were also on our side uh, simulated to do more. Uh, so from that bulky thing, we transferred the technology into the headphones, uh, this uh, prototype is a wooden one. Again, not really the best uh, thing, but it was less heavy. Uh, the sensors, everything was inside uh, inside the headphones. Uh, the following prototype, again in 2014, was smaller, and uh, we used. Mm, other technologies were, were, that were also lighter. It was good. So um, with this third prototype and with some money we, we raised up with prices here and there, we decided to, to go to New York where um, 
the market possibly was more uh, mature. Uh, mature. Uh, so uh, in this case, it, it was at the leadership conference for the American Foundation for the Blind. There were like hundreds of, of visually impaired. And again, it was really, really great because we had a lot of support and a lot of feedback. For instance, if you if you see this picture, you will notice something, and yes, we, we noticed that, is it was clear uh, this this guy, it was really a nice guy, he had um, a podcast for the blind community, he is blind, and he was using the headphones like this because we were uh, excluding him in some way from the outer world, and yeah, so just by looking at the, this picture where you can see him without um, without headphones, you immediately understand that having both uh, both headphones is not a great idea. Um, so um, the support there was good, even even too good because they they told us, well, it's it's good, it works, but why are you doing it only for architectures? Uh, couldn't it be for many uh, things like work of art, yes, but also bottles of wine. How can we see if a bottle of wine is as red wine or white wine, whatever? We want to know what is the content of um, something. But that was challenging because, you know, uh, it requires a lot of uh, effort to, to put some technology on something. You can't just do it on every bottle of uh, or any possible objects. So we started thinking about a, complete, a completely different approach. The approach was instead of putting the technology on the object, I mean, the expensive technology on the object, why don't we put the expensive technology on the person, on the user, and instead we could use just very, very, very inexpensive and cheap sensors and we put the sensors on the object so these uh, kind of sensors they are called nfc sensors they cost like five cents each so you could embed it on on a bottle of wine if you want it and the technology is more expensive but you wear it is like having um and a telephone. So basically, uh, you touch the object, the object as a sensor, the sensor transmit, transmits to your um, telephone uh, the information, the relevant information. And you know, for instance, if that bottle of wine is red or white, uh, is uh, uh, a Chianti or, or whatever. Um, so we started thinking about this idea. We had a lot of support and we had great expectations because you know it could extend potentially uh, the market and it could be uh, more useful and more interesting but then the problem is that you have great expectations but when you start prototyping it, it really doesn't exactly work straight uh, straight uh, away so it's what they call the Ancan Valley so you have great expectations you have uh, you think that is a good idea but then when you put it live it doesn't really work as you expected and well this is <laughs> the first prototype I'll, you you may notice that it's not really um, an easy uh, wearable device it worked uh, like like a charm it was perfect but it was too big uh, to um, the battery just wasn't enough, maybe 20 minutes or something like this. And then we started using um, uh, boards that are standard boards, but they are smaller. This one is called Shadow, is made by a company called Seed Studio. It's modular, it's cheap, it was for the first time something that was almost there. And then we switch to bespoke uh, electronics because we couldn't anymore use um, standard prototyping boards. We had to design and develop uh, the things by our own. It was a, a less than a small company. So it wasn't easy to do it, but 
well, we tried uh, to do it. And already in the first years, um, we managed to to go from that thing that is has the size possibly of a melon uh, or a watermelon even over your head and the, the size of, of the other one was between a cherry and, and, and a small apricot so it was uh, a, a good a good um, improvement uh, so uh, then we contacted a company uh, that made uh, silicon molding and we started producing the first ring that looked like more or less professional. So we went to the uh, Milan Institute for the Blind, where they had already nice 3D, uh, 2D and half uh, prints that they used with, with students. And uh, we, we started embedding uh, some sensors on it. And here you can see uh, the ring is quite small and it was working so we we had then the interest from uh, other companies from the startup world from investor we were starting winning prices we were starting winning grants and we also had some commission jobs so we had money and we invested every penny on trying to develop it further. So, uh, frankly speaking, we uh, it was a kind of no, a real no profit company because everything we 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 got, and uh, we, we we managed to find some money uh, was completely reinvested. And these, for instance, is the first time where we uh, went public that was uh, 2017 uh, this is the Arapache Museum in Rome it's a big museum it's an interesting place has been made by a great architect is normally full of tourists because you you have um, pieces from the ancient Rome so it has tons of, of visitors and in this occasion we uh, met Deborah Deborah Tramentozzi, you, you see her in the picture. Uh, and Deborah is a young, well, was a young girl, uh, now it's a young lady, let's say, and, and she she was born without sight. So she was completely blind. She is completely blind uh, from the very uh, beginning. Nevertheless, she's passionate about art. She now has a, a degree in history of art. And, and for the first time, we had a real, a true ambassador, because she, you know, she, she gave a sense, she gave a meaning to everything we, we, we were doing. Because she, um, when I was going to a museum saying, you know, it's, it's meaningful to, um, to, to have more accessibility, they always told me, yes, yes, you're right, absolutely. It's not our priority, but yes, yeah, you're right. And then we will call you. And that was quite hard. When... Deborah was with us. It was completely different. She she just said simply as it is, why can't I visit this museum? Why do you think that I am not allowed to, to get into this place just because I'm blind? Do you think that is fair? Do you think that is right? And that really changed um, the way, you know, we were approaching uh people and also she made me um, see things that i didn't understand or haven't seen just my uh eyes so she uh became uh yeah kind of really an ambassador and this is uh deborah at the ted um ted edition in rome i was there with well, like i think three thousand people and when she um ended a talk there was a, an, a, an enormous standing ovation everyone was really even crying how, how strong it was um, um, talk and uh, intervention and uh, basically she's fond of art she can just by touching things uh, she can understand a lot of things and again that was a, a great motivation for us and so we improved uh, improved the uh, ring. So right now you, you, you can see some renderings or, or 
the latest or almost uh, the latest uh, ring. Um, in this case, it's just digital images uh, or 3D renderings, which are absolutely important because we couldn't print everything and you know print test, print test, print test. We had to simulate uh, things. We had to uh, try to do things as small as possible. And 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 rendering uh, renderings are really crucial while you are uh, prototyping. This is the printed version of the almost the last ring, and this is the ring printed with another printer with another technology. But you can see they it's starting looking. I wouldn't say professional, but it's less prototype and more and more uh, an object. Um, so because we had this, we started also being more popular. We won uh, other prizes. This one is um, is the National uh, Innovation Award in Italy. So uh, people were starting, uh, you know, being interested at that thing. Uh, this is in um, Istanbul, where we won uh, the, the, the first prize of the Technofest. And normally they asked to move to Istanbul. We didn't accept it, but uh, it started rolling. And instead of, you know, sitting and, and developing that, uh, we switched on on another version of the same product which was instead of being a ring which caused some problems mostly in terms of battery we switched to um, a wristband and also because what we noticed is that uh, i now have a ring uh, i think you you still can see my my face I, I know that you still can see my face this is the ring and sometimes instead of wearing it the blind person was just using as as an object and instead of with with the wristband uh, the user experience was better in some way and uh, it allowed us also to perceive um, a goal that we had and this is the Albers exposition that has been um, exhibited in uh, Siena in Cork and in Zagreb and in this case, the idea was to extend really the technology to all, so any visitor uh, could use uh, these wearable device to have an extended, an extra layer uh, of information and also 3D prints that they could touch. So it was for the first time something for all, uh, which was our first idea. It was to do something not intended for blind people only, but for a wider public. And the most important thing, it hasn't, it, uh, it didn't have to be something that was specific for blind people in um, a place specific for blind people. The idea was to uh, show it in, in any museum in the same place where all the visitors were uh, and a technology that was really for all and not only uh, for a niche or for a restricted um, category. So uh, I, I would end the first part of this uh, talk, which is the, the journey uh, through to the journey to um, uh, the UNESCO for All project uh, with this um, slide, which is uh, the design thinking method. And we, unfortunately, we discovered this uh, kind of method after a few years, um, after we started the project, because uh, the main lesson that we have learned, and it, it, it looks like quite a simple thing, but it's not. And I, and I was talking to a student today, and I think there's still, um, uh, um, um, how would you say, we don't give enough importance of the first part, which is the empathize, which means listen, 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 listen to the users, listen to their needs, mainly when they are extreme users, when they are fragile users, or when they are specific or particular users, you have to hear from them. Uh, this is what makes you 
um, switch from something that is just an idea to, to something that is meaningful, useful, and uh, yeah, that the, the second thing is to just don't fall in love with an idea, and this is all about when you when you prototype is is the fourth um, the fourth circle there is just prototype and test, and then is iterate everything. So you you do it, and then you test, and you go back to the users. You let them try, and you see if it works, and if it doesn't work just have to do it again and possibly to change even dramatically everything so we we started from something that was on the object then it, it went on on the person uh and then it, it was on the head and then on the finger and then on the wrist which is quite you know uh, even time consuming and energy consuming but i think it's is the only way this eternal um, prototyping approach and uh, yes so I uh, don't know what, whether if whether you you want to uh, just discuss about this first part of the topic which is quite heavy quite big about you know a, a long journey journey and about about empathizing listening or if you have time and if you are not sleeping, um, I would, Frank, what do you think? I would instead possibly go to the part two. Well, maybe we could have a, a quick question, question answer session. If yeah. anyone has any, any questions about um, what you have presented so far, and uh, because I have a question, I I'm really interested in the testing, especially on this slide there, the, uh, and the feedback loop that the user, how does a user, um, uh, feedback uh, about the um, the whole process is it literally just a question? Yes, I can use it. It mm. works for me. Or how 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 else is the feedback recorded or interpreted? Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing you have to to keep in mind is that if you make some questions, normally you push the answer. Like, do you think that this is useful? And yes, it's useful. No one will tell you, yeah. no, it's not useful. So you have to formulate, you have to build the questions in a way that is not pushing uh, towards a specific answer. And even if you start from scratch, you should, shouldn't should even start thinking about the idea before having a feedback. So the idea is, a consequence of a definition of a user of a specific problem and it's not something that you build and then you want to validate so that's the first thing then i've noticed it i've noticed that well with blind people is easier uh, unfortunately i would say to watch them closely without being too invasive you know because if you're doing something and i'm staring at you frank you will be you know why are you looking at me but by watching closely how the people do things mm. you really see a lot of things for instance we notice that many of them just used it in the wrong way so when you see that everyone is using in the wrong way possibly your way is wrong <laughs> so you have to flip it because it's better on the opposite side or when you see someone that is doing like this it means that it's not a good idea to cover the years so you even if it's not telling you explicitly uh verbally something you will notice many things that you you wouldn't and you couldn't just with digital forms or with yeah with paper so you have to test with them you test yourself you test with them you watch you see, you react, hmm. you change, you test again. It would be also, the, that's, that's a very good uh, good point that you, know, you need to sort of put yourself into the mindset of someone who is visually impaired, I imagine as well. Um, and the other, the other thing I'm wondering is how does it, what what the, the visually impaired person gets out of using the software? How does how do they interpret interpret what 
they are touching that we normally see visually. So has there been any tests done about that or any sort of any, again, like a feedback loop sort of thing? So well, that's what you're feeling. This is what you're understanding about this artwork. Could you re model this artwork in your own way now never having seen it but only have touched it yeah um well this is uh, really sorry <coughs> i'm sorry about that. um um this is really a good question because we we we've been always been shy in translating mm -hmm. works of art uh i i never had the courage to do it so when someone was asking me uh, could you um, build a replica of this painting for a blind person uh, the answer is always no i'm not able to do it you should ask to someone who does it um, professionally and when someone makes this translation i can print it for you i can build it i can put sensors but i will never translate um, a painting for instance because I'm not able to do it, and I don't know whether is it whether it is uh, trustfully where, where it is. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is true. Yeah. It is, true. It is yeah. true. So what we do normally is only translating three D objects to three D objects. So sculptures, architectures, things that you know where the meaning is in the form rather than mm. in the color because it will be hard for me to say what, what red is like in 3d i i don't know the answer uh but but that that's a point when the first time we went to the museums and more than the, even you know when when you talk to to, to a politician or oh, you, you need to to raise the awareness about the problem and they they ask you like but why do you want a blind person to go to to watch uh, in, in a museum? Why it, it doesn't? It, it can't see things, so there's no need and there's no meaning. And that's yeah. You, you can say yeah, you are right. But if if you say, for instance, the Paralympics, uh, people without legs they want to run. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to run because they want to say. I have no legs, but I can run. I, I can be like you. I can even be better than you, or I can experience what you experience. I want to do it. I don't want to feel excluded. So even if what you do is not enough, and it will be never enough, it will be never, you know, the red is not going to be translated fully, but it's much better than nothing. Sure. Yeah. And that's so that, also kind that, of that is a very good point. And it's a, this whole thing about inter interpreting and reinterpreting artwork and especially for people who have never experienced it for one reason or the other whether they're visually impaired or whether they've never seen never been to a museum before i uh, could also be that couldn't it? other privileged people so i think it's a very very interesting uh, area that could be researched even more as well and maybe something made from that so <laughs> uh, this, this is what we're here for this is where we're in this lovely center for print research so uh, i'm slightly uh, wary of the timings um and just sort of like to open it up to if anybody else has got any questions to fabio about the um about what has what he has presented so far um either put them in the q a in the chat box on the right hand side or just put your hand up and we can invite you to the stage if not uh if if, ha if fabio if you're happy to um carry on just showing more of the idea well uh, it, i will i will be um quick i will be okay. quick for instance i could i could skip um the, the video because the part two is starting from there uh there uh well the, the, there is a video showing um all the process that we uh, carried on at the cfpr for building objects with embedded sensors so i will skip it also because it is somewhere in our website i can add uh, it to the recording afterwards yeah 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 uh i'm, I'm happy for to, if everybody else is happy to stay and uh, listen to fabio for the second part as well we get two for the price of one today with you fabio so you <laughs> know it's just it will be really it will be really uh three minutes uh just more about showing you the outcomes than the process itself. The process has been uh, 
quite quite um, complex because we we used uh, different technologies. I got pieces here that are really really nice and beautiful and and uh, perfectly printed and replicated uh, also thanks to to all, all, all the incredible resources we have here uh, Xavi helped um, in in photogrammetry and uh, Sonny Tom uh, they helped with, with with 3d printing so it was really a, a team a team job and the outcome was a series of of panels for different cities around Europe uh, in Bulgaria in Croatia, in Italy and Spain, um, UNESCO sites. So beautiful sites, important sites. And the the idea was to make them more uh, accessible. I will show you just one of them is the Alhambra. I think you all know uh, the Alhambra in, in Granada, in Spain. And uh, we had a problem in the meantime, uh, COVID. Uh, so normally we had to go there to scan the things and to build the pieces, uh, replicate it, go back there with a community of blind people coming from Spain with others coming from other parts of Europe. That was not possible. So we had really to invent a way to carry on the project, even if COVID was out. So uh, we we just started from, from Google Maps or any kind of resources we modeled. Uh, this is the uh, lion's uh, courtyard, the uh, Patio de los Leones, and this is the fountain. Uh, so this one, for instance, has been replicated from some pictures, and there was uh, a guy on, on the internet that made a lot of pictures, so we could reconstruct it uh, from there. And uh, we it was a low, low poly and low detail model, but with the help of photogrammetry and, and other tricks, we could add details. So what you see here is what you, you are seeing here. So it's really, really small, but still when you touch it, you, you can feel things. But if no one is telling you that this is a lion, you will never, never, never find it out just by touching. That's the main problem with touch is that it's useful if you already know the object. So if I know this cupboard, I touch it and I say, okay, it's a cupboard because it's, it is in my memory. But if it's the first time, no, no way. And so that's why you need some braille sometime or, or someone explaining it to you. Uh, but this makes you weaker, less independent because you always need someone. And the good thing that we received from the blind community is that with the help of technology, you, you are more independent because you touch something that is not telling you the whole story, but with the additional information that you have on the headphones, okay, now someone is telling me that this is a lion. Okay, that's a lion. That should be the head and this is the nose. I don't have to put 1,000 sensors everywhere because when you decode more or less what it's about, then you, you can proceed by your own. And um, this is the um, a selection of, of, of the models we made also with, with thermoforms molding to make it really affordable and accessible to all. And uh, the last one, I'm really cutting it short because I'm aware of timing, but in any case, people could go in the real place and experience um, that's in, in Granada, as you may see, and, and a selection of blind users, they were able to be in the right place, in front of the right thing, to touch the replica, to uh, listen to contents and to have an idea, have an experience of the thing there in the right place with other people sharing a different experience, but in some way a common ground they could have a discussion about it. I could, have, like I did with Deborah, I could talk with Deborah about things she touches and I see, and we have things to discuss about, which is the great thing about, about you know, accessibility and, and things for all, and not the museum for the blind and, um, and you know, uh, restricted access to, to 
such a common ground as art. So I'm, uh, I would end now, uh, absolutely open to, to uh, chat, to questions, everything you want, anything. <laughs> Thank you, Fabio. That was very fascinating. Was very, um, I use the word insightful because I haven't actually known, known any of what, uh, not that much about your work myself. So I hope that was the case for a lot of people that uh, have joined us today to learn more about um, how you, how you all started getting into this type of research on, and your research as well now, and what sort of technologies are being used and what the feedback is from other. From other users and i suppose in the in covid times we where we we're not supposed to be touching uh everything and anything and wiping things down all the time i think it's a very it's a nice challenge to be able to um to do things like that and I suppose when you when 3d printers become more uh, become usable as well and and affordable for um for visually impaired people maybe they could also then print these thing, uh, things out themselves uh when they are at home uh, so they can actually experience visual art or, or 3D visual art at home. We do it from the screen, but a visually impaired person might need to print it out themselves. So uh, are there any plans to make this available um, as sort of open docs as well? Yeah, or? absolutely, absolutely. Still, it is not as easy. So you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. you can do it. Still, there's okay. a barrier, uh, but I mean, it's much easier now than 10 years ago, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So what's the space, is it? Sorry? It's, it's, a, it's a question of watch this space and let's we will develop this further. Well, thank you very much, Fabio, for, for, the, for your thank talk. Thank you. For taking the time. Um, and is, is there any, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat or just um, uh, raise your hand. Um, some don't be shy. Don't be shy. I'm gonna have a quick look there. Um, there's a question here from Alana. Um, with headphones, like you said, there's a sense of being excluded. Did you exper experiment with surround speakers at all? Yes, yes. Um, uh, that, that's a good question because it would be much better to have, uh, to have, uh, speakers, surround speakers. Um, the interesting feature about it is that you have really an individual uh, feedback, like, like for instance, uh, you have the content in your own language. Is It could be also tailored on your need. And because it's so specific to touch, uh, I mean, um, well, I have sensors here. When you touch something, you have the feedback. So the problem is that you have to make one-to-one -one replicas because you can't experience the same object uh, on multiple users, while with headphones you can. Uh, mo most of them, they just use, they don't use the headphones, they just use the phone. They put the phone here and it's quite, quite good. Uh, we experienced the idea of, of making single users experience and it works without, uh, without headphones. And I was impressed one day in one of the makers fair. I, I was, um, there was a guy that had, I don't know if you ever experienced that is, is, um, is, is cochlear technology where you, well, it, it put um, a kind of wristband here and this vibrate uh, makes made vibrating all the bones so you just take your finger and you put your finger in your ear which is quite weird but you listen perfectly because of the transmission through the bones in your ear and that will be for instance a nice solution you have a wearable device it's not invasive not intrusive and if you want to listen to something you just do like this and you are not completely exclu excluded and we also use uh, um, gestures so you move your hands and yeah th there's room for improvement uh, enormous room for improvement okay well thank you Alana for the question thank um, you Alana and I say thank you as well. So yeah, I'll. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we shall wrap up then. So 
again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Fabio, for your for the time you've taken to to present your work. Uh, and so, just enough uh, at the end of the session, just for me to say um, that you welcome everyone to join us on the twenty fourth of November, uh, where we have uh, Caroline Witzum, who uh, to, who is presenting to us about uh, her project from soil to weave. Uh, Caroline is a recipient of uh, the uh, Spike Island uh, Fellowship, uh, student fellowship last year, and she's going to report to us on her um, her findings. So thank you for today. Thank you, Fabio, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye-bye.